Just a few announcements before we get started. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great, thanks. I'll try to not mumble. I'm looking at Shirley. She accuses me of mumbling. <laughs> Anyways, um, here we go. Altar of the flowers this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Jane Long and Mary Royer from Susie Burkert. Uh, birthdays this week, um, Maria uh, and Donna. Didn't know about that one until just now. Um, we continue our Tuesday evening Bible studies uh, via Zoom. Uh, please uh, contact me if you have any uh, desire to join the group. Um, we are uh, towards the end of 2 Samuel, uh, towards the end of David's reign. Um, events this week uh, on the bulletin, it says consistory meeting tomorrow at four. We've moved that to uh, uh, Tuesday the 19th. Um, so just in case somebody was gonna show, we won't be here tomorrow. Um, the office will be closed uh, this week. Um, Brian is also gonna be away. So if anything comes up that you need, uh, you can reach out to me. I don't know what to do, but you can reach out to me anyways. Um, and then next Sunday, we'll be back here and it's TV Sunday next, next week. Okay, our call to worship. Uh, the call to worship is a, a little bit um, different in that uh, to just read it um, kind of makes you wonder why you're reading these particular passages, but we're going to find ourselves uh, starting in Jerusalem and ending up on the Mount of Olives with Jesus uh, in uh, our section on Mark today. And um, Jesus is going to be talking about uh, things happening in the future including uh, what's going to happen to the temple. Um, so it's a split uh, uh, reading. We're going to start in chapter 10 of Ezekiel, uh, 18 and 19, and then skip to chapter 11 and uh, verses 22 and 23. So, hear God's word. 
Then the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. The cherubim lifted their wings and ascended from the earth right before my eyes. The wheels were beside them as they went. The glory of God, the glory of the God of Israel was above them, and it stopped at the entrance to the eastern gate of the house of the Lord. And then chapter um, chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them lifted their wings and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord rose up from within the city and stopped on the, mount, on the mountain east of the city, which is the Mount of Olives. Uh, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we bow before you today. We pray that you be merciful to be with us as we desire to worship you in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts and our minds. Again, we bow with thankfulness and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Please stand and join me in our opening hymn found on page 318. Come thou found of every blessing. Okay, good morning. And I know that opening <laughs> call to worship was a little bit enigmatic, uh, a little bit mysterious, but that is the departing of God from the temple. Ezekiel's talking about the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. And where does it go but the Mount of Olives? So thank you for reading that, Phil. Um, all right, let's see. Our Old Testament reading is Psalm 18, Psalm 18, verses 1 to 19. Psalm 18 is a psalm of David, and he's talking about God's deliverance from his enemies, especially even death itself. Um, in David's case, it's the enemies. It could be Saul. Um, that's perhaps some of the context. But uh, it's a prayer that David prays. It's a praise to God, and it invites all the readers of this psalm, those who were singing it then, uh, to find their own stories of deliverance from death here and those things that would seek to take life. Here it is resting upon the reality that God 
is the one who delivers. And so um, we're going to read the first 19 verses of this psalm. Hear God's word, Psalm 18, starting in verse 1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. And I cried to my God for help. He heard my voice and out of his temple and my cry for help before, his, before him came into his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils and fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him. Darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them, and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of water appeared, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Here ends the reading of God's word. And you did note there, hopefully, that, um, you know, this is... God is not this pushover. He's not just uh, a nice guy. Uh, there's a side to the Lord that is very daunting, powerful, mighty. And we see that in this psalm as he deals with the enemies of his people. So, okay. Uh, we come now to our time of prayer. And... With the, those words of the psalm, uh, we will pray uh, to our God, who is the Lord of all, Yahweh. Uh, but this is a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon. And it's also intercessory for those who are on our hearts and minds today. Our prayer list is, is on the back of the bulletin. Um, so we'll pray for those folks. and. Uh, I will give you a moment of silence to pray, and then I'll lead us in prayer, and we'll hold off on closing in the Lord's Prayer until we celebrate the supper today. So uh, let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we come as your people today to worship you, we are reminded of who you are, the Holy One of Israel, great and powerful. You made the darkness your hiding place and the canopy around you, the darkness of water, thick clouds of the skies. You thundered in the heavens. And your voice, like the thunder, you are like the lightning that flashes, great in appearance. Father, these things describe your very nature. 
And yet we also know that you are merciful. And your loving kindness is from everlasting to everlasting. And it is through your son that you demonstrate your love toward us, toward your creation, by sending him, giving him as an offering, that through him we might find life and find it abundantly. We thank you for that. And it is in him that we come this morning to seek the forgiveness of our own sin, which is great in your sight and worthy of your condemnation. And yet through your amazing grace, we ask for that fount to come and to cleanse us to wash us, to make us clean, to renew in us clean hearts that desire you first and foremost. Father, forgive us the ways we have failed you and encourage us, strengthen us to live for you, to give all, to trust completely and wholly upon your word. Help us to do that this morning, to know that we are yours and you are our God, that you hear us as we call upon your name. What a privilege that is to have, have the, hear, the ear of heaven to hear us and to minister to us. Father, we thank you for that. Give to us that sense, that feeling of belonging to you, knowing that we are yours. You are with us. And Father, as we come this morning, we do pray for those who are in our hearts and minds. There are those who we have listed out and continue to pray for, intercede for. We think of Forrest and we think of Roy and Janice and we pray for Barb and for Mary. We pray for Wilda and Susie. And we remember the families of Mary Royer and Jane Long. Father, we pray for Gwen we pray for Jim, for Nora, for June. Father, we lift each one to you, knowing their concerns. We pray for Jack. We pray for Marvin and Marilyn. We continue to lift up Maria, as she travels for work, and Jack and the family, as they cope without her during the week, and we pray for travel mercy. Father, we pray for Garth Valeski as he struggles with Lyme disease, and we rejoice with David and Melanie and the newlyweds. Lord, we thank you for their relationship with you. And Father, we think of all of these things. We lift up our children and our children's children yet unborn. We give you praise. For the gifts that we have received from your hand. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for the authorities who lead us. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you turn their hearts toward you, that they confess your name, that they bow before you and your word, that they would seek wisdom and understanding from your hand. We pray for our congregation the many who serve, 
we pray for the ministries. We think of Bible study and Sunday morning Bible study, Tuesday and prayer and all of these things. We ask, O oh Lord, that you give us greater opportunity. You give us faithfulness to serve in this community in whatever ways that we may find to proclaim your word. We pray for the congregations in this area who serve you. We ask that you bless each one. And so, Father, we commit these things to you today. And we pray for the celebration of the supper later this morning. We lift it all to you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, it's time for the, <laughs> the young people's message. And uh, all right then, um, yes. <laughs> uh, all right, so our young people's message. If, um, if I were to tell you that an event is coming that will change your life, what would be the first question you would ask? It would be what, right? What event? 
And if you knew that, so let's say you know what the event is, what would be your next question? It would be when. When is it going to happen, right? When will it happen? Why would you want to know when? Why would you want to know when? It would, it would be so that you could be prepared, right? That you wouldn't be caught off guard, that you would be ready for it. So uh, in our passage today, Jesus tells his disciples that a very big, very significant event is going to happen. And he tells them what it is. One that will change their lives. And so, what question do they ask? They ask, when? When will it happen? And they add another question. They add another question. What will be the signs to tell us it is about to happen? In other words, how will we know and what will we see and can we prepare for it? So those two questions come as Jesus tells his disciples about a very significant event taking place. So a couple questions to think about as you listen to the message. And I will ask you after a couple questions to think about what is the event that is to happen? What is the event that is to take place? And then how does Jesus answer them? Because they're asking when and and what signs will accompany it. But how does Jesus answer them? I think this is probably the more curious question. We don't get the full answer today because we're looking at the, the chapter 13 is a unit. It goes together, but I'm going to break it up. We're not going to have the whole answer today. So we'll have to wait uh, for a couple weeks. Um, but that's the... Uh, that's the young people's message. That's what I want you to think about. And so what would the treat be? Well, it is a question of time. When? When will it happen? So the disciples, they're going to find out they need to have, as we so often need to have, patience. We need to have patience. So the treat is take five. Just take five and think about what's going to be <laughs> Okay, let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for these young hearts and young minds. And we thank you for some of these old ones as well. Lord, we, we pray for them. We pray for each one that uh, as they contemplate your word, um, that they find in it the very ins and outs of everyday life, the questions of what and the questions of when and how to prepare and all of that. We pray that you continue to instruct them in wisdom with grace and love and mercy and all of those things that you have uh, thought needed to do that. We pray that for not only the youngs, but the olds and all of us. We ask it to the glory of Christ, amen. Okay. Let's get to our passage then. We're looking at Mark 13, Mark chapter 13, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. So I mentioned again that the chapter is really a unit. It goes together, but I'm going to divide it into three sections, three sections, and then... Uh, We'll explain, but let's read it first. We'll read verses 1 to 13 of Mark chapter 13. So hear God's word. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard. I usually say that, but... Some of the words may be different, and that's okay. We'll talk about it. But teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another 
which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, there will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not for you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father is child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Here ends the reading of God's word. Okay, that's the first 13 verses of Mark chapter 13. Mark 13, kind of like Matthew 24 is one of the most challenging chapters uh, in its understanding, in terms of context and understanding, especially for the modern day reader. We often want to read, to read it as an apocalyptic agenda or schedule for the end times, for the end of the world as we know it. That is what we often call eschatology. The chapter as a whole is a unit, as I have said, but we're breaking it up into sections to help us navigate through according to its context and meaning. So uh, I'm closely following R.T. France here in his uh, understanding of, of this chapter. France has agreement with N.T. Wright to a point, but sees a subject change in verse 32, which turns the conversation toward the parousia or the return of Christ, which is more like the, the end of what we're talking about. But that's not until verse 32. So the initial subject of verses uh, three to 31 is the destruction of the temple. And it's the destruction of the temple before this generation has passed. So as I go through this, I'm going to point some things out. I may raise, I may challenge you to think about this in a new way. And I may raise more questions than I answer. And I understand what's happening. And so it's going to make interesting the Bible study next week. Um, so I look forward to that too. But Again, if you have questions as we go through this, if you think, hey, wait, I don't agree with this, write those things down and let's talk about it because I think that's going to be good. So, all right, the one thing I want you to take away today is this, departing the temple, Jesus declares its destruction and the coming challenges his followers will face as they proclaim his gospel. Departing the temple. Jesus declares its destruction and the coming challenges his followers will face as they proclaim his good news. Our context marks gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. We say it every Sunday morning. 
uh, according to, or as it is written by, the prophet Isaiah. And rem remember here, Isaiah the prophet had forecasted a new and greater exodus that was to come. It is not a stretch to see that Mark has arranged much of his material to communicate that very thing, that what is taking place in the person and actions of Jesus is just that, God coming down to deliver his people in a new and greater way. From the voice crying out in the wilderness and baptizing in the Jordan, to Jesus' actions of forgiving sin, controlling the wind and waves, and feeding the multitude in remote places, it all resonates with the Exodus themes. And from the middle of chapter 8 to the start of chapter 11, Jesus focused his teaching on his disciples about who he is, his mission, and what is to take place when he reaches Jerusalem. Jesus challenges his disciples' view of the kingdom, turning the world's value scale on its head. The first shall be last, the greatest shall be servant of all. And using themes from Daniel 7 and Isaiah 53, Jesus predicted his suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection to his disciples on three different occasions. When arriving to Jerusalem, Jesus does three things that unambiguously claim he is the highest authority in the land. Riding a foal of a donkey, cursing the fig tree, stopping, bringing a halt to the temple activity at one of the most important feasts of Israel. So last week we saw the end of the questions and answers between Jesus and his interlocutors, those Jewish authorities who were seeking to discredit, to undermine him with the crowd. And as Jesus had been teaching in the temple since 1127, so from chapter 11, verse 27 on, we've seen these back and forth with Jesus and the Jewish authorities. Jesus then asks his own question. All of that comes to an end. Mark shows Jesus clearly as the victor. No one else would ask him a question. But then Jesus asks his own question. He's not merely the son of David. The scribes are set against the kingdom value scale, and the widow who gives all is the hero of the story, a portrait, if you will, of the Messiah himself, who empties himself, humbles himself to the point of death, who's going to give all. Our text today is a continuation of these themes, turning the world, the Jewish world, on its head. So let's take a look. We start with verses one and two, and we'll break it up here uh, into three sections, but verses one and two, and these verses, I want you to know, um, we have a chapter break here, but it doesn't mean that these start something new. They actually conclude what was said before and kind of function in two ways, concluding uh, what came before and starting what comes after. So, uh, verses one and two, as Jesus leaves the temple, one of his disciples points out the wonderful stones and the wonderful buildings. This is incredible. This is an incredible building. This is Herod's uh, rebuilding of the temple, and it wasn't even finished at that point. But the stones and the buildings so grand that it could have been called, even at that point in time, the greatest in the world, and if not the world, then certainly in that area. It was tremendous, and one of the disciples points this out. Look at the grandeur of these stones and this building. And R.T. France notes here, verses 1 and 2 of 13 function as both the conclusion, as we've said, and then the opening to the teaching that follows. The unnamed disciple here, perhaps a Galilean, you know, maybe he hasn't gotten to Jerusalem that much, but here he is in the midst of it. I don't know, you know, you can think of, think of the times when you've been someplace new. Maybe it's downtown New York City. Maybe it's downtown Chicago. You look at the massive buildings and you see all this and you say, wow. And this is kind of the picture. Maybe a Galilean 
is putting forward. He's very impressed by the massive stones in the temple buildings. And here in a place where his words could be overheard, Jesus predicts, he declares, the destruction of this great and massive building. Not one stone will be left on another. Some will accuse him later. You see, this is said in a public place, and some are going to accuse him later. We know their testimony is inconsistent, but we're going to see in chapter 14, some will say, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple. So Mark is, you know, he's preparing us for that, but also what follows. Jesus doesn't say that he will destroy it, but that it will be destroyed. This is a striking statement. Uh, I, I don't know how we can grasp just the magnitude of what Jesus is saying here, because this is the centrality of Jewish life. This has been that way for thousands of years. I mean, this is the temple. This is the center of their universe. And he's saying it's going to be destroyed. So very striking. If there was any question remaining after his private teaching on the fig tree and his public action of stopping the temple activity, there is no doubt now he has verbally expressed it. And this is yet another challenge to the disciples' worldview and their understanding of the kingdom of God, that there will be no place for this wonderful building in Jesus's kingdom. Something is changing and it's massive. So Jesus departs the temple. He departs from the east and he crosses the Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives. And this is perhaps an echo of what we heard from Ezekiel. This would have resonated in the ears of those first readers of Mark's gospel. Here, the glory of the Lord is departing his temple, and he's taking up residence on the Mount of Olives. And so we're set now. We're going to come to this next few verses here where we are set in opposition to the temple. Mark is telling us that. Verses 3 and 4, similar to earlier occasions, I want you to think Jesus has said something publicly, something very difficult. And now his disciples, at least the first four chosen, we see Andrew added to the inner circle here, but his disciples pull him aside privately and subsequently ask him about what he has just said. What is going on? Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, again, opposite the temple, and that's likely for Mark's early readers a a reflection of God departing that temple. It also emphasizes the subject of uh, the destruction of the temple. And so their question comes in that context. So I want us, as we think about the question that's going to be asked, what is the subject of that question? The subject, very important here to follow, is the destruction of the temple. Okay? Tell us when Will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? These things, then, as the subject, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are to happen? These things being the destruction of the temple buildings. There is no change of subject between the first and second question. That's very important to uh, note. There's no change in subject between the first and second question. Those questions go together, and they're about the same subject. Verses 5 to 13. See to it, no one misleads you. Here's verses 5 uh, to 7. As we look at this section, I'm taking 5 to 13 as one, but I'm going to break it into smaller units here. Verses 5 to 7, Jesus begins his answer with the idea of restraint. See to it that no one misleads you. So we're not starting with the when. In fact, we're not going to get to the actual when uh, in terms of Jesus's response until verse 14. 
So we're going to have to wait until next week before we begin that. But what does Jesus do? He starts with restraint. He says, see to it that no one misleads you. In other words, be discerning. Don't jump to conclusions. Be steady in your understanding. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. There will be those who say they represent the Christ. That they are the leader, that they are king, that they are come to, to, to lead Israel out. But they don't. Don't be misled. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, that, but that is not yet the end. So when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. So again, there's a restraint here. Things will continue the way they have been. Don't be shaken by them. Don't read into them. End times. What are we talking about? When do these things take place? Or, you know, from our perspective, what is Jesus talking about? He's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the destruction of the temple. When is the temple destroyed? AD 70. We know that. We also know of different things that take place leading up to that. But here Jesus is saying, uh, these things will continue. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. And again, I remind you, now I know you know this, but I'm just going to remind you that they didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have social media. The way they heard about wars was word of mouth, right? It just would, it may be a long time before you hear about a war that took place. Okay, so they didn't have that instantaneous, oh, this is going on in the world. And so when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. And then he says, but that is not yet the end. What end is he talking about? Again, this is the word, the Greek word telos, which means the end of a process, the end uh, of something taking place. And here we have the context hasn't changed. So what is our context? We must keep this together in its context. And that is, again, the destruction of the temple. That is not yet the end. In other words, these things are not showing you that this is when the temple is going to be destroyed. Historically, as I said, we know the temple was destroyed in AD 70, and not one stone was left upon another. In verse 8, the wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and natural disasters as well. Verse 8 continues what is said in verse 7. Earthquakes, famines, but these are only the beginning of birth pangs. Well, what is the, uh, you know, this is only the beginning of it. This isn't even the when, we're not even there yet. So these are not signs showing when, but only that it is coming. We're not going to get to the when until later in verse 14. But it involves all of these things, nations against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, earthquakes, famines, these natural disasters are the beginning of the birth pains. What are birth pains? <laughs> Do I, you know, moms know <laughs> what these birth pains are like. But birth pains in the scriptures, in terms of scripture, often talk about a period of suffering. And they look at a period of suffering. This is describing, it's a metaphor for a period of suffering. But it also says, look beyond Right When we talk about birth pains, we're not only thinking about the, it's a period and, and it is a period that ends because what's at the end of it? You know, at the end of it, there comes joy. But so these, this is kind of the metaphor that's before us. And this is only the beginning. 
So these are not signs showing when, but only that it is coming. And so in verses five to eight, Jesus describes events that should not mislead disciples or that they should read into. The events are not signs pointing to when it is coming, only that it is coming. That's something, isn't it? I just want to think for a moment. You think about when we watch the world today, what do we do with the wars and the famines and the earthquakes? What are some of the things that Christians do right away? They kind of jump, don't they, to the, hey, this is a sign of the end, isn't it? The, I just, I'm not saying that's right or wrong or whatever. What I am saying is that at this point in time, to his disciples, Jesus is telling them explicitly, don't do this. These things are going to take place. You remain calm, not frightened, steady. Don't read into it. Okay? He's going to give them a role as well. Verses 9 to 13, Jesus still doesn't answer the when or the signs that point to the when, but now tells his disciples about the role they will play in this period before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Their role will be, as he's already talked to them about it, to testify of him, to testify to his gospel, his good news, and they will endure persecution for doing it. The language here reflects both a Jewish and Roman persecution. We're talking about synagogues and courts, governors and kings. And the good news, it says, must first be preached to all nations. And we note that must first be preached to all nations. You know, there's another thing to think about here. These first readers of this gospel, what was still standing? It's likely the temple was still standing. And they're talking about the gospel going out. Paul is going to make his way to Rome, the center of the known world, proclaiming the gospel. These words here are intended first and foremost for the disciples of Jesus's day. And when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. N.T. Wright notes, and I think this is a little bit of humor, that these words were not meant for modern day preachers. We are not to <laughs> wait, right? Um, and not to, not to think about what we are to say. That is not meant for modern day. These are words given to his disciples in that day, in that generation. So important. We must understand that context. And it says, and you will be hated by all on account of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. Think about what took place under the rule of Nero. Emperor Nero and the persecution of the Christians. These things are taking place before that temple and Jerusalem is destroyed. The war begins in AD 66 and goes to 70. Temples destroyed. If you want to understand some of the graphic nature of what took place, look at the historian Josephus and his description of that war. Incredibly sad. We're going we're gonna to look at what Jesus does say in verses 14 and following next week, but let me make a few points of application, then we go to the supper. The primary context and meaning of these words is to the generation of Jesus's day. The events referred to took place before AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. 
As we stand on this side of those events, we see the fulfillment of Jesus' word. This is incredibly important. It is a very clear attestation that Jesus can be trusted, that he is trustworthy. His words are true. He is reliable in what he says. And as his disciples, we too may expect difficulties, and some of them even as bad as what they experienced then. We too may expect the difficulties as we go about proclaiming his good news, even though we're not facing those circumstances of that generation. We have to understand that. We do have his promise to be with us, to intercede for us, and ultimately to bring us into the presence of God and the fullness of his joy. Departing the temple, Jesus declares its destruction and the coming challenges his followers will face as they proclaim his gospel. Let's now move to the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the meal that Jesus gave to his disciples and he gives to us. It's an outward expression of the inward unity that he brings about through his life, death, and resurrection. These actions we take with the bread and the cup express this. So I'm going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, the words of institution, and then we will distribute the bread and the cup. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray and then we'll distribute the bread. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time together that we might join in the celebration of the meal that you gave to us, your disciples, your followers, that communicates more than just bread and cup, but a unity that it is, is established in your work, in your life, in your suffering, in your death, and in your resurrection. Help us to understand these things. Unite us, we pray, to know that we may celebrate with one another the amazing work you have done. We ask now that as we do this, you would set aside in as much as is to be used the bread and the cup to your glory. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
his body, which is for you, take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's distribute the cup. Cup of the new covenant in his blood, take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join me in our closing hymn found on page 370. 370, O oh God, our help in ages past.
people of God receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the ever-abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.